This certainly looks like a reasonable deck. He's got multiple Vanquish the Weeks. He's got multiple Vampire Zeals. Bishop of Rebirth, which can be a really powerful card. But, uh, you know, other than the Mavern Fine, doesn't have the really go-wide ability that you look to see in a lot of these decks to really exploit something like the Anointed Deacon. When playing with or against Ixalani vampires, you might have noticed they use terms and classifications that are reminiscent of the Christian church. An apostle, a deacon and a bishop here, a few gothic ass letters there, and of course the consumption of blood. Literal blood in this case, not red wine. But the similarities run much deeper. Join us in exploring the vampires of Ixalan. Ixalan was placeholder, placeholdered uh, by Jenna Helland as uh, Vampire Conquistadors. Vampire Conquistadors. That was the initial pitch for the plane of Ixalan. And with that, creative got to work. A certain type of helm, the Spanish Morion, has become a visual shorthand for Conquistador. To make the ones on Ixalan more visually connected to the vampires, their Morion ends in two points rather than one, symbolizing the fangs of a vampire. The halberds got a similar treatment, also ending in two sharp points. But first, we need to discuss the origin of the Ixalani vampires. An important artifact on the plane of Ixalan is the Immortal Sun. It has existed for thousands of years and eventually was given by the Sphinx Asor to a little monastery in the mountains of a small country of Torazon. This reminded me of Santiago de Compostela, especially the cathedral. It has the claimed remains of Saint James, the patron saint of Spain. The place was part of the Asturian kingdom in the 8th century. Remember that name, we will come back to it shortly. Over the years, the immortal sun became an important religious artifact and was protected by holy custodians. It also gave the local monarch more prestige, which led to jealousy from rival rulers. Eventually, the monastery was attacked by Pedron the Wicked, who led an army that took the immortal son by force. The last custodian was left for dead on the floor. Her name? Elenda of Garano. Elenda recovered and she swore an oath to bring back the immortal son at any cost. It was not in Pedron's possession anymore, as Azor took the artifact back. Elenda searched the lands and eventually took a ship eastwards to the continent of Ixala. Growing more and more desperate over the years, because he couldn't find a trace of the immortal son, Elenda started dabbling in black magic. She eventually sacrificed her own soul to be able to continue searching. In that process, she became the first vampire on the plane of Ixalan. After centuries of searching, she finally returned to her own continent, where petty rulers were still squabbling amongst each other and had forgotten about the immortal son. While Elena was away on a quest, the ruler of Torreson died and the kingdom was divided among their three children. The older sister got most of the lands, while the two younger brothers each got less. This is not unlike what happened in the year 910, when the kingdom of Asturias, in the north of the Iberian Peninsula, became separated into three parts. It was divided among the sons of King Alfonso III, into the kingdoms of Leon, Galicia and a much smaller Asturias. Back on Ixalan, the two brothers united and waged war against their sister. They became known as the Apostasin Princes after the Church of Torreson denounced the brothers as heretics. For three centuries the families waged war against each other, before Elenda helped crush the Apostasin armies with her vampire magic. She confessed to have taken the so-called blessing of vampirism, which was interpreted as an act of self-sacrifice. A bunch of the Torreson nobility quickly followed undergoing the transformative ritual, now known as the Rite of Redemption. For a lot of vampires, the Rite of Redemption is an act of personal sacrifice for the greater glory of state and society. But there are also those who view vampirism just as something to utilize for more personal wealth and power. With the vampiric nobility at its disposal, the church quickly dealt with the apostasy princes and unified the realm again. But there was a thirst for more, and the whole continent was taken over during a 4 century period. While on our world, it took 800 years for the Reconquista to reconquer the Iberian Peninsula from Muslim rulers. 
The Church and the Monarchy banded together, giving rise to the names Legion of Dusk and Church of Dusk. With Torazon firmly solidified, the vampire nobles became restless without having to wage war. When whispers arrived about the immortal son possibly being on a different continent, they had a new focus for their greed and experience in war. And so the Legion of Dusk undertook a massive expedition towards the island continent of Ixalan to try and find El Dorado, uh, I mean Orasca, and thereby reclaiming the immortal son. So, let's take a closer look at the internal hierarchy of the Ixalani vampires. First, the Church of Dusk. Their Pope, so to say, is called the Pontifex of Dusk. Below the Pontifex are the bishops, who oversee the clerics, who in turn get assistance from the deacons. Some clerics are known as glorifiers. They are specialized in bolstering the pious by bestowing blessings of the church upon them. The glorifiers extensively use blood in their rituals. On the battlefield they use the blood that has been shed in battle. Other clerics are condemners, who literally condemn enemies who don't recognize the authority of the church of dusk. A condemner can wither flesh, corrupt the land and even draw blood from one's pores. A special order of condemners, known as the shade binders, are able to capture and bind undead spirits, which are then used as ship guards. The Church of Dusk also has its version of saints, called venerables. These are dead vampires that are held up as paragons of the ideals of the church. One of these venerables is Tarion, as seen on Legion's Judgment. A devout vampire can call upon the power of a venerable by using something that belonged to said venerable, such as a tooth or a weapon. Torazon is currently ruled by the Mordonera family. When a ruler dies, their firstborn child becomes the new ruler, a style of inheritance known as absolute primogeniture. The current monarch is Queen Miralda VI, also known as Miralda the Pious, who has ruled for over a century. She was also in charge when the Legion secured dominance over the whole continent. The Legion has developed unique fighting styles during centuries of waging war. Among them are the Quick Blade, an elegant and quick style for fighting with rapiers. The Humbling Blade, a style for longswords focused on overpowering the opponent. And Bloodletting, a technique focused on anatomy using a few precise stabs and cuts to specifically attack major veins and arteries. The Legion also fights from horseback, and in their invasion of Ixalan they brought plenty by boat. These horses are large and fearless. They are supposedly crossbred with lesser demons and have developed a craving for flesh. The horses reminded me of the Friesk Hinde, a breed of large black horses from our province in the Netherlands. Their ancestors have been used in the Middle Ages as war horses throughout Europe, not in the least for their ability to carry an armored knight. During the Middle Ages, a whole lot of knightly orders were established, such as the Knights Templar. The knightly orders of the Legion are inspired by these medieval orders. Being part of a knightly order is the highest mark of honor for vampiric nobility. All orders are blessed by the clergy, and the majority of them are under direct command from the monarch, such as the Sanctum Seekers. Led by Argoel, the Sanctum Seekers were the first knightly order to travel to Ixalan. They are tough, adventurous and thrive in the face of adversity. Upon arriving on Ixalan, they immediately battled against the forces of the Sun Empire and emerged victorious. Some orders, however, are made up of knights who are so pious, they are mainly focused on their religious loyalty. One of those orders has the evocative name, the Bloodstained. Not only do members wear red collars, not only do they abandon community, family and marriage and even their own purity, they have to kill their family and drink their blood. It's no surprise they are considered fanatics. Blood is an important team with vampires in general, but on Ixalan it's kicked up a notch. According to the church the blood is holy. It brings life, it's proof of your lineage. But there's also the promise of ever flowing blood. It's believed that reclaiming the immortal sun will give vampires true eternal life, instead of the undead existence they currently lead. While blood is a source of sustenance for vampires, the act of deliberately avoiding ingesting blood is called the blood fast. During a fast, a vampire becomes more and more hungry until they become hyper aware of their surroundings. The church has declared the accompanying mad fury the purest form of devotion. The vampires are forbidden to feed on the human citizens of Torazon. 
They are, however, encouraged to feed on heretics, outsiders, rebels and enemies. The feeding is called the Feast of Blood. No, not that one. Nor that one. This Feast of Blood makes the Gorging Vampire stronger and faster. Now let's see how the vampiric structure and culture influence how they invade the continent of Ixalan. The vampiric invaders have successfully set up multiple forts in the area they named Queen's Bay. Their holdings are collectively known as Miraldenor. The naming conventions of these vampires are not terribly inventive. Just name it after Queen Miralda. She'll like us for it. The authority of the queen is embodied by a viceroy, a position currently held by Ilia Sotonoris. She is not very good at it, as her mind is set on vengeance on the pirates that killed her brother. She'd rather attack pirate fleets than govern the land. Luckily for Queen Miralda, she has more eyes and ears on Ixalan, called the Queen's Agents, who report to her directly. These forts are the main defenses against raiding pirates and attacks from the Sun Empire. The latter just wants these invaders, these vampires, off their lands. Adanto was the first fort constructed. It's named after Adrian Adanto of Lugio. After multiple failed attempts to get a foothold on the continent of Ixalan, Adrian Adanto settled on a small island in the bay. It has since become an actual port town where the Queen's Viceroy does their business. On top of some Sun's Empire ruins, the church built their own fort and named it Durand, the Fort of Faith. It's in a near perpetual siege by the Sun Empire, which draws in many paladins from Torreson. At Durand they can find battle, something they miss back at home. When they don't engage in fights, they search Ixalan for the immortal sun. The Fort of Leor, also named the Edge of Exile, started as a simple structure. Over time the structure was expanded again and again, until the little island it started on was completely overtaken. Fort Leor has become mostly self-sufficient, capturing people from the Sun Empire to feed on. It's a brutal and cruel place which attracts the most brutal and cruel vampires. The fort is shrouded in a thick fog and surrounded by spirits the vampires brought from their homeland. Finally, let's talk a bit about the individual vampires. First up, Fona. Fona of Yedo loves fighting. So much, she received her nobility for fighting ruthlessly. She got her Butcher of Magan moniker during the Apostasin War after sneaking into the walled village of Magan and personally slaughtering the leaders of the stationed army. Afterwards, she opened the gate so her personal force could finish the enemy off completely. After the Apostasin War was over, Fona got her own land, but she handled poorly. She killed off her human serfs, abandoned her lands, and offered her services as a duelist in the largest cities around Torazon. When she heard about the expedition to Ixalan, she was on the first ship going there. She expects to fight at her heart's content with dreams of becoming the ruler of the Golden City. Mavren, on the other hand, acts less selfish. He's a high-ranking cleric who took it upon himself to go to Ixalan to be the eyes and the ears of the church. He truly believes that the immortal sun can bring eternal life to the vampires. So the church built a huge ship for him, which includes a recreation of the Grand Cathedral. On board the clergy practiced their fasting ritual, but storms, shallow waters and the pirates terrorized the ship, slowly diminishing the crew. Mavren in response destroyed the ship's navigation equipment. He wanted to show his unwavering fate. And sure enough, after the ship crashed into the cliffs, Mavren was the sole survivor, which he interpreted as validating his quest. The High Marshal of the Sanctum Seekers is Argwell. He has his trusty Mastiff Piago by his side and a two-handed sword named Redeemer. He gave up on inheriting his family's wealth in favor of becoming a paladin. Upon learning about the expedition to Ixalan, Argwal was given permission to create a new order. The Sanctum Seekers were born, dedicated to finding the Immortal Sun. But all Argwal has found so far is the Temple of Aklasots, the magic version of Kamasots, who is the Sapotec Deathbat, associated with Night and Sacrifice. At long last, we return to Elenda. After she helped crush the Apostasin armies, Elenda went back to Ixlan to continue her search. 
According to Sun Empire legend, the Bat of the East met with Aklasots and put herself to sleep. When Oraska wakes, Elenda wakes up in a tomb near it. Watli and Angrad happen to pass by and this exchange happens. I left the church with the knowledge of the ritual to take on my burden and they used it to become invaders? Watley glared. What were they meant to do with your gift? They were meant to learn humility. Watley's jaw fell open. The Legion of Dusk? Humble? They were meant to search for salvation for us all, Elenda continued. I see I must teach them what they forgot. Elenda straightened and a great shadow fell across her face. She stepped forward past Watley and Angrath and vanished into a dark slice in the air. When the story of Ixalan is at its climax, Elenda is in the Golden City, as are Fona and Mavra. She appears just as the immortal sun disappears, as she tells Fona and Mavra and the audience the following. Her order was meant to guard the immortal sun, not use it. This dark power that we took into ourselves, the horrors that we wrought, all of it was meant to give us the strength to find the immortal sun and protect it from the likes of Pedrin the Wicked and those who would use its power for their own selfish ends. Our humility and deference to forces greater than ourselves light the path to our salvation, not the immortal sun. She orders Mavrin and Fona to take her to Queen Miralda, and the three vampires disappear into the night. At first we are led to believe that the Ixalani vampires are evil and a carbon copy of what happened in 15th century Spain or Europe as a whole. The takeaway here is the real world colonization of the Americas was capital B bad. Colonization is draining the native blood to feed on. It's a parasitic relationship, not a symbiotic one. When Alenda proclaims what the Legion of Dusk is doing is utterly selfish and completely besides the original point of protecting the immortal sun, there is a religious analogue as well. 15th century Europe was extremely religious and the Catholic Church had major influence. However, what's still unknown is exactly how Elenda became the first vampire. There's nothing concrete, but there are a few hints. Aklasots is the bad god of the night. They are opposed to the threefold sun and the sun vampire. Coincidentally, the main enemy of the vampires when they arrive on Ixalan. The only bat in the two sets is also an imp, a small demon. It seems that vampirism on Ixalan is brought there by a demon. They lurk in the shadow of ancient ruins and spread plague and corruption across the land. Perhaps vampirism is a way of spreading corruption to people. The ancient Mesoamericans believed that sea notes, natural pits or sinkholes were portals to the underworld. A lot of bats would emerge from caves surrounding such sea notes. Maybe the temple to Aklasots is a portal to the underworld as well. At any rate, I hope we explore some of the mysteries surrounding Elenda's turn to vampirism in an eventual return to Ixalan. And who knows, what else might lurk in the shadows. Thank you for watching Cavern of Souls, hope to see you next time.